Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, and uh, greetings from the Dobson home in Anchorage, Alaska. I would like to extend greetings from Denise and myself to our brethren here in the Anchorage and Soldatna congregations, and we also have many across the Philippines who may have the opportunity to view this sermon as well. So I hope you are doing well, and we certainly pray for you, pray that God will, will keep you safe from the virus that's spreading and and just bless all of us as we prepare to appear before God on the first festival of the Passover. How the world has changed in the amount of time since we saw each other face to face. The daily news is coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. At least that's what seems to dominate ours. First of all, we have a slide. I do want to again give credit and thanks to Sander Krombach for uh, sharing this slide. It is a picture of the city of Jerusalem. We're from the west looking at the Dome of the Rock and then across, across the valley we see the Mount of Olives over on the far edge. And somewhere at that time, the events of the Passover took place with Christ and the disciples. So again, I want to thank you uh, to Mr. Sander for sharing that picture online. Also, here is our title, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. That comes from John 14, which is going to be our basic uh, area that we're going to focus on as we get a little bit into the sermon. Uh, I do want to give credit where credit is due. I would recommend if you have the opportunity of uh, finding a copy of this book by John MacArthur, just simply called The Upper Room. He largely just looks at John 13 through 17 and uh, has a number of chapters there, and I Thoroughly appreciated his, uh, his commentary. Now, coronavirus. There's a lot of hype in the news. And the reality is there's a lot that we just simply don't know about the disease. There's a lot of fear that is spreading. It can't help but impact us as the people of God. There's so much we do not know about COVID-19. <coughs> And when fear spreads, it certainly is for good reason, as we look at how many are infected with the disease and how many thousands have already died. We don't know where it's going to end, but we do know that God's on his throne and God's plan is right on time. So, stern actions are being taken in this country, in the Philippines as well, and across so many countries of the world in trying to get the contagion to stop. Uh, meanwhile, the world's economy teeters on, uh, on the edge of the abyss. It's uh, a bleak time. Um, all of this has caused the United Church of God and probably all churches to cancel face-to-face -face Sabbath assemblies, Sabbath for us. Uh, we enter a new phase of gathering together in our homes uh, watching sermons online or listening to audio sermons. Uh, this is the means by which we are given to be spiritually fed right now. I don't know about you, but right now what I want is comfort. Comfort. And thankfully, God gave us a great deal of comfort. Comfort comes from the Word of God. And again, we're going to shortly go to a chapter where Jesus, that last Passover night, focused completely on comforting the disciples who were very ill at ease that night. Let's begin by reviewing some of the events that led up to what was happening in the upper room, as the one gospel refers to it. To do so, I want to go, first of all, to Luke's Gospel. And we'll just look at a few highlights of some of the events taking place that night. In Luke 11, excuse me, Luke 17, verse 11, uh, Now it happened, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. 
So they are traveling to Jerusalem. That's where he is going to end up. In chapter 17 of Luke, it goes on and tells of the healing of the ten who had leprosy. And, of course, tells the story of the one who came back to give thanks. We also then have an account where the Pharisees were asking him about the kingdom of God because they continually were looking for reasons to condemn him and possibly have justification for killing him. Now, by way of contrast, the disciples at that time felt very strongly that Jesus was going to become king at that time and rule in great power. They did not comprehend that the kingdom of God would be established at his second coming. That would be down the road a long way. Now in John 18, or pardon me, in Luke 18, again we'll just notice a few highlights. Beginning in verse 31, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and insulted, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Now this is something that Jesus had told them before, and he would tell them again. But it was a concept that the disciples couldn't wrap their minds around. They thought he would become king, become king then, but rather he was going to be horribly abused, killed, and then rise again. Now, in this chapter, it follows by telling the story of the um, healing of a blind man near Jericho. And then while in Jericho, Jesus and the group went to the house of Zacchaeus. But if we go to chapter 19, chapter 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Again, this is the mindset the disciples had. They thought he was going to become king and reign in great power. Now, Following this, we have the parable of the minas, as it's commonly called there in the New King James. It was given because some thought the kingdom would come then, but in reality it was going to be down the line a ways. As we get later into chapter 19, we read that beautiful story. As he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So you remember the story. Uh, the colt that was there that had never been ridden, the placing of clothing, on the colt, Jesus rode. Others placed their clothing on the road where the colt would walk. And so it was the fulfillment of a number of prophecies. If we would skip on to chapter 21, we, we find Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple that was in its glory. Herod's temple was in its glory at that time. But it was going to be destroyed. And he also, in chapter 21, answered the question, uh, what would be the sign of his coming? And so he spoke about false religion, false Christianity, uh, wars, famine, pestilence, and, and all kinds of sorrows that would come upon human beings. As we get to Luke 22, we find Judas's role is described as far as a plot to betray that would lead to the killing, the murder of Jesus. Uh, Judas was involved, Luke 22, verse 3, then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And the amount of the betrayal was prophesied, and it is mentioned 
But let's go a bit further. Luke 22, verse 24. And notice as we're getting to that chapter where we're going to be going to the Passover, verse 24, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And so sadly, all the way right up to the Passover service itself, the disciples were squabbling over who would be greatest. We find they were filled with attitudes of self-promotion, pride, and arrogance. They had a lot of rough edges that need to be smoothed over. We realize they didn't have the Spirit of God then. That would come. And we notice, especially with Peter, he was dramatically different after the Spirit of God came upon him. But for now, they're still arguing over who's going to be greatest. Well, let's switch over to John's Gospel at this time. And in John 12, late in that chapter, beginning of verse 31, we read these words. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, and we know that was Satan the devil, will be cast out. And I, Jesus speaking here, if I am lifted up from the earth, referring to the death of the Roman crucifixion, will draw all peoples to myself. This said he, signifying by what death he would die. And so Jesus tells them in very clear words that he would suffer and he would die. He also has told them that he would live again. But he revealed in the verses that follow that one of the twelve would betray him, turn him in to the, to the uh, Jewish leaders. As we go to chapter 13, as we are well aware, the earlier half of the chapter deals with the foot washing services actually are there in this room where they're having the final Passover with Christ. Notice in verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now what he is doing here is making it very clear that one of the twelve would be betraying him, turning him in to the powers that be. Judas's identity is revealed as you would follow the story. Peter asked John, John reclining on against Jesus, asked the question, the answer was to whomever I give the sop. And so we have at least John and probably Peter becoming aware that Judas is the one who's going to be betraying Jesus. And yet it's always good to focus on the fact that just a bit earlier, Jesus rose from the dinner table laid off his outer garments, took water, and began washing the feet of all of the disciples. He washed the feet of Judas, knowing full well that Judas was going to turn him in to the, Roman, to the, uh, the Jewish leaders a bit later that evening. We drop down to verse 27. Now, after the piece of bread, or the old King James calls it the sop, J Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. I think we should also remember that the final steps that Judas took, he was merely the pawn of Satan the devil. Satan entered him. He was in control whenever the actual betrayal took part. We go a little further. Verse 31 so when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now, now the Son of God, Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. We've reached the point in the Passover, the new symbols, and all has taken place. Judas has left, and um, the die is cast. Everything has been set into motion. Then we go to verse 38. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, and he's speaking to Peter, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Three times. He had prophesied that all of them would desert him, but then specifically that Peter would deny him three times. Let's pause right here before we go to chapter 14 and just think of the, the incredible week of contrasts that the disciples had experienced at this point. Many contrasts. They went from squabbling over who was going to be greatest to hearing that Jesus was going to suffer and die. They went from observing the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to being told that they would all desert him and one would deny him repeatedly. They went from dreaming about how much power am I going to have in the kingdom to watching Jesus get up, take the role of a servant, wash their feet one after another. So it had to be a very perplexing week of contrasts that they had gone through. Now on one hand, Jesus knew exactly what lay before him. It troubled him greatly, as we would see later that evening from his prayer to his father, that if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was going to happen. He would undergo abuse, betrayal, desertion, ridicule, mocking, scourging, and he would then be crucified after the Roman manner, until death freed him from his sufferings. And all this while, the disciples had no clue as, what, as to what was really about to transpire. Can we, to some small degree, relate or identify with how the disciples would have felt that night? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure that we can. And we remember, they did not yet have the Spirit of God. That would come weeks later on the day of Pentecost. But we find ourselves, for us, Christ returned to his Father long ago. We don't know when he'll return. We're told we can't know the day or the hour. We can know the signs. In the meantime, we suffer many afflictions, many trials, many frustrations, many injuries and sicknesses, all for his name's sake. We share in his sufferings. Sometimes life is a royal pain. Sometimes we truly do get stormed all over. And yet at other times we experience the highest of highs. So as we come to the end of chapter 13, the disciples were bewildered, confused, perplexed, and I'm sure just Scared. Scared. Sometimes we are as well. And so in this setting, Jesus moved from telling them, you're going to desert me, from telling Peter, you're going to deny me, he moves to chapter 14, and he begins to pour out comfort. He begins to give them reassurance. And I can't speak for you, but I can use some reassurance, and I think we all can. We all hunger for that right now. Jesus begins to pour out the comfort that they would need to endure the rest of their Christian life. So John 14 is a sermon about God's comfort. God's comfort. Oftentimes, before the Passover, we go through the routine. We focus on self-examination because the Bible tells us to. And we focus on Paul's instruction to discern the Lord's body. So we think through what he went through, what he experienced. Um, we remember the, the, immense, the immensity of the love of the Father and the Son as far as what they went through for us. We have messages about repentance and forgiveness and the meaning of the foot washing and the bread and the wine and all of this is necessary. But you know, these can be sobering, sobering and heavy concepts. 
We also need to remember that on the final Passover night, when Jesus was here on the earth, he focused on comfort. Now, dictionary.com defines the word comfort as this. To soothe, console, or reassure. To bring cheer to. And so we should not overlook the comfort that Jesus offered us that night. The foundation of comfort is faith. The disciples needed faith, just as we need faith. Faith simply defined is the degree to which we believe God and his promises. Let's, we'll come right back to John. But in Hebrews 11, verse 1, a very familiar verse, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Down to verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So everything that we go through in life revolves around our faith. When we gather on the Passover in our own homes this year, Everything we walk through on the Passover night is something that is perceived by faith, by our belief that God is, and that he's working out his purpose in our life. Faith is simple, childlike trust, and that's what God wants for us. The answer to every situation that we may face is faith. The key to endurance until we are born in the eternal family of God is faith. As limited human beings, we always can use reassurance. So as we go back to John 14, we have Christ's sermon of comfort. A sermon of comfort. And if I could try to paraphrase what he's going to say in this chapter, it would be this. First of all, he's telling them that even though I must leave you for a while, I'll never forget you. I will never forget you. Secondly, he reminds them, you can trust every promise that I ever made to you. Number three, I am showing you the way to the kingdom of God. Number four, he reassures them, you will be with me in the kingdom. And number five, realizing human frailty, he says, I will send the help you need to endure. I will send you the help that you need. Again, the only concept the disciples had ever known about Messiah was that he would come in great power, he would conquer, and then he would rule the world. They thought that greatness would be returned to their people, Israel, then. And yet Jesus told them that he was going to die. So their entire belief system was rocked to the core. Messiah had been prophesied to come to perform many purposes, but back in Isaiah 61, we read, The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison of those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. To comfort all who mourn. And so, every word that night that he spoke, whether it was a warning, a prediction, a teaching, or a promise, every word was designed to prepare them for the shock that he was going to die, but that they're going to be all right. John 14, verse 1. I love this first part. I use that as a title. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Even though He's preparing them for the fact that he physically would leave. His presence, spiritually, would always be with them. 
But you see, these disciples had grown up with the stories of the great men and women of the history of Israel. Uh, they heard of the exploits of Israel. They were aware that God told Moses, be strong and of good courage. And God told Joshua the same, be strong and of good courage. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. So they grew up hearing these stories. And the same God who said that to Moses and said that to Joshua also said to them, and says to us what we read in Luke 12, verse 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And let us always remember that verse. God is in the business of building a family and adding names to the book of life. Now back to John 14, this time verse 2. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So here he begins again underscoring the fact that he's going to leave for a while. He must go to prepare for the upcoming phases of the plan of God. Again, they saw him as a conquering king. But he's telling them that first he came as a suffering servant and a sacrificial lamb who was going to give his life for the sins of all of humankind. He reassured them that this was precisely as God and the Word planned it long ago at the foundation of the world. He tells them, you will be in God's house. But first, he had to go make some preparations. Now, as we read here, in my father's house are many mansions. The King James and the New King James uses the word mansions, and that's unfortunate. Probably the word rooms would be a better, more accurate translation, at least as far as what it, what it pictures, what it would, uh, would teach. You see, in Jewish culture, back in the first century, whenever a son of a family reaches a point where he would marry, uh, he and his bride would come back to the family home. They would add on a room. They would add on a wing. There's always room for family. More room would be built on, if need be. And so in God's house, as sons and daughters are added to the family, there's always more room. Ultimately, we read the end of Revelation of the New Jerusalem, and you look at the dimensions of that, of that gigantic city, and uh, there's room for God's spiritual family to live there all together. Well, let's go on to verse 3. Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So, again, he's going to go, he's going to prepare, but he's going to come back. He's telling them, I will remember you, I will remember and follow through with every promise I have ever made to you. The time will come when we will be together literally forever. Let's drop down. To verse 6. A question was asked, and now he's answering the question. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A famous scripture here, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus went on, and he's telling them, He's going to go, but in doing so, he's going to lead the way to the kingdom of God. You don't need a map. Keep your eyes on me and follow me, is what Jesus was, was saying. He, of course, is the very embodiment of truth. And he was going to re-inherit the glory that he had had with his Father for eternity and lead us toward that eternal life. 
All we have to do is follow, which as we know is easier said than done. Let's drop down to verse 9. Verse 9. Have I been with you so long, and you, yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Again, throughout Jesus' ministry, they saw one miracle after another. They were aware and probably saw Lazarus coming out of the grave after he had been dead for a while. They saw people with leprosy who were healed. They saw those who were blind suddenly able to see. They saw all kinds of miracles, and so they became increasingly aware of the fact that Jesus truly was Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. They saw him do things no human being could do. He was all-powerful. He was invincible. The idea of his, of his death was something they could not comprehend. But this night... Jesus reaffirms his own divinity. The Father is divine. He also is divine. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus has divine power and authority. He was one with the Father, but completely distinct from him. The night before Christ's death, they didn't comprehend fully who he was. But you know, Christianity is all about believing. Christianity involves walking by faith, not by human eyesight. Let's drop down to verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. You know, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we look at these words. They would do greater works than they had seen him do. They would receive more power than they could even imagine. The eleven, as we have gathered at this point of the night, the eleven would become twelve again, as Matthias is added. They would begin spreading out, fanning out the world to preach the gospel. We find in the book of Acts great miracles being performed. In fact, when during Christ's ministry were three thousand people added to the, the church at one day? Well, whatever they needed, Jesus reassures them, just ask. Because the name Jesus Christ stands for everything that he is. In verse 15, he moves to a part of the night when he is reminding them, reassuring them, I'm going to send you help. I'm not leaving you on your own. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. What a beautiful scripture. Spirit of God is given to those who are obedient people. We demonstrate our love for God by how we live our life in harmony with the commandments. In verse 16, and I pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Helper is the word that the New King James uses. Uh, other translations may say comforter. Uh, they may say advocate. The New Revised Standard uses the word advocate. Someone working there on our behalf. A helper. That he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. The Spirit of God was working with them, but there's a distinction whenever the Spirit of God is in us, and actually God living his life in us through the essence of that Spirit. The Greek word translated helper or comforter is parakletos, 
And it literally means one who is called alongside. Jesus says, I will send you the help that you will need to endure. For over three years, Jesus had been their paracletos, or their paraclete. He had been the one there directly working with them. But there would be this power, this, this essence of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit that would be given to them. Down to verse 18. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Again, he has to leave for a while, but he will come back. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. So again, within a day, Jesus will be dead. But here he guarantees to the disciples that he would be raised from the dead. He would live again. And not only that, he would come to them. And he would show them the way that they must walk in order to live forever with him. Down to verse 20. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest, manifest myself to him. So, God will dwell in us. We will be the very temples in which the Holy Spirit lives. The disciples obviously were puzzled. They didn't know what all of this meant. However, when the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost, they, they understood. They were changed. They were transformed. And they went about performing their Father's business. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So the Father and Son will come to those who love God and obey their word. Verse 26, that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Verse 27, we're getting towards the end of the chapter, but once again, these beautiful words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. As we get down to the end of the chapter, the latter part of verse 31, Jesus simply says, Arise, let us go from here. And in the next chapter, it takes place outside. And he begins talking about the vine and the vine dresser and all of that. They leave the upper room and make their way toward the Garden of Gethsemane where some of the next steps would take, place, would take place. So as we gather for the Passover service, as always, it'll be a sobering night. It will be a somber, serious occasion. Rightfully so. It's a memorial service. We remember the Lord's death he comes. In the meantime, we continue to examine our lives. Sometimes self-examination can be disappointing, if not borderline discouraging. But God tells us, let not your heart be troubled. We all make so many mistakes, and so many times we find, yes, we have sinned once again. We focus on the sufferings of Christ, we focus on the broken body. We broke, focus on the shed blood. We remember the story from the Exodus and how much pain and suffering it brought the Egyptians because the Passover was kept there. I've often referred to holy days, some holy days, as being bittersweet occasions. 
And Passover is one of them. And the Day of Atonement is another one. It's a bitter, sweet occasion. There's a lot of bitterness because we remember what Jesus went through for us. We remember the suffering. We remember the death. We remember all the pain. But we also need to remember the sweet side, the victory that we're given over sin. There is a sweetness to the night of the Passover as well. So on those occasions, when life clouds up and just unloads on us, let's remember the words of Jesus Christ from John 14. Again, to summarize, Jesus' words of comfort. I must leave you, but I will never forget you. Every promise will be fulfilled. I will come back to you. I will show you the way to the kingdom. I will send the help you need to endure. With that helper, you can overcome the world, just, just as Jesus did. But again, back once again to that beautiful verse, verse 27, the latter part. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Despite the current distress in the world around us, let us be comforted to know that God's plan is right on time. Let us rest assured that it is our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. I think it would be appropriate uh, at this time to end with prayer. So if you will bow your heads with me, we'll ask God's dismissal. Our Heavenly Father, our great Almighty God, we come to you as the undeserving recipients of your love, your grace, your spirit. Thank you, Father, for having chosen us, making us a part of the very elect. And now we thank you as we come to, once again, the spring of the year, and we begin walking through the Holy Day plan of salvation. The first step is the Passover. We thank you for it. We know, Father, that you made the ultimate sacrifice of allowing your only Son to go through what he went through. You did this, he willingly did this as well, with the expectation of bringing many sons and daughters to glory. We know you have an eternal purpose for us. We thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. And Father, we pray that you will lift us up and give us the power of your Spirit. And thank you for reassuring us, for comforting us. We ask, Father, your dismissal, but we live in perilous times. We pray that you will set your angels around every one of us, the body of Christ scattered all over the world, certainly be with our families as well. We thank you, Father, for all you've given to us. We love you. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.